everyone. A very good afternoon to all of you and a very warm welcome to NUS Yonglulin School of Medicine eOpen House. We are a bit disappointed that we are unable to see and hear you in person. However, we hope you were able to catch our students in action as they responded to simulated clinical scenarios earlier this afternoon, guided by our very own Professor Suresh, who's here in the panel with us this afternoon. Well, if you were unable to catch the action, not to worry. Click on our YouTube and Facebook sites and you can catch the recorded action. This afternoon, we have prepared a program that we hope is informative and helpful as you consider joining us at NUS Medicine. But before we begin, let us go through a round of introduction for, of our today's panelists, Professor Shresh. Thank you, Sishong. Hello, hi, my name is Suresh. I'm from the Center for Healthcare Simulation and I'm also part of the admission committee. I'm a practicing emergency physician at the National University Hospital. And um, I'm looking forward to the day when we can all resume our travels. I'm, I'm quite happy to be here with you today. Over to you, Arvin. Thanks, Prof. Hi, my name is Arvin. I'm a year four medical student. I'm also currently serving as the 72nd Vice President of the NUS Medical Society. A few fun facts is that uh, in my preclinical years, I actually stayed on campus in Newtown as well. I'm very happy to be here uh, representing my fellow students, and I'm happy to any answer any questions that you may have. Uh, Caitlin? Thank you, Arvin. My name is Caitlin. I'm a third year medical student this year. Uh, just like Arvin, I spent my first two years on university staying on campus. Uh, in my free time, I like to do embroidery, and I also have an interest in the medical humanities. Brian? Hi. I'm Ryan, a second year medical student here at NUS Medicine. I'm currently involved in Neighborhood Health Service, Project Sabai, and I was the project director for Medicine Rack and Flag in 2020. In my free time, I like to go for spin classes. Prof. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, I'm Marion. I'm a pediatrician by training and I work at the National University Hospital. I'm also assistant dean for education with the medical school and chair of the admissions committee. And I'm happy to be with you all this afternoon. Well, as you can see, our faculty and our students are very interesting people and I can't wait to talk to them already. Well, it's not that they have a lot of free time on their hands, it's just that they're multi-talented. And so I, I can't say the same for myself. My name is Tzu Xiong. I'm a faculty of physiology. I'm also one of the assistant dean of education. And in case if the students are, have any questions regarding physiology and are not tired yet of seeing me, they can also find me at the King Edward VII Hall where I've been staying and living for the past few years. But enough about me. Right now, I would like to welcome our Dean, Professor Chong Yap Singh, who will take us through the historical journey of our school, as well as share with us some of the exciting developments on the future of healthcare education in the post-COVID world. Professor Chong, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Sir Chong, for that uh, uh, introduction. So, uh, welcome everybody to the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, or we like to call ourselves NUS Medicine. Uh, we are uh, currently the leading medical school in Asia, number one in Asia, and number 19 in the world, according to the Times Higher Education uh, World Rankings. And this is a view of uh, our, well, some of our medical buildings. Okay, so um, first of all, let me uh, wish all the women uh, in our audience a happy International Women's Day. Uh, we, th this year's, the theme for this year's <clears throat> uh, Women's International Women's Day is choose to challenge. And I think this is a year that all of us should choose to challenge uh, any uh, situations that uh, favor one gender over another. Uh, and this is the year that we make a difference because it's the year that we will celebrate uh, SG women. So you should know that the um, <clears throat> medical school is located in a comprehensive university campus, the Cambridge campus. So our medical school is uh, here near the National University Hospital and of course next to us is dentistry, science, nursing and public health. Uh, but across the Cambridge campus, we have business, the business school, computing, arts and social sciences, design, engineering and so forth. So basically all the uh, uh, academic disciplines are represented on this campus. And of course, across the Ayuraja High uh, Expressway, we have University Town uh, and the CREATE campus. And then we have the A-Star, Bahapolis, and Fusionopolis uh, also across the road from us. So uh, uh, on this campus, you will get 
a rich exposure to all the disciplines uh, in, in, that you normally find in any university or science uh, campus. So the Yonglulin School of Medicine is one of uh, four health schools uh, in the National University Health System. So we are the Yonglulin School of Medicine and we have an LSD Center for Nursing Studies. So we also train uh, nursing students, both undergraduate and uh, graduate. Uh, and we have a uh, Faculty of Dentistry and a Sausage Hawk School of Public Health. And we are all on the Cambridge campus. But uh, the National University Health System also has the Alexandra campus with the Alexandra Hospital, the Jurong Health campus with Ting Fong General Hospital, Jurong Community Hospital, and Jurong Medical Center. And then we have our polyclinics uh, across the Western uh, part of this island. And uh, we have a community campus as well. So, and on this, uh, in this National University Health System, we also have uh, three national centers. They are the National University Cancer Institute, the National University Heart Center, and the National Univers University Center for Oral Health. So the Yonglulin School of Medicine is a proudly Singaporean medical school. It was started by a Singaporean, four Singaporeans, uh, ever since 1905, and we trained all the doctors for Singapore for about 100 years, and now we're 116 years. So let me uh, now show you a, a six minute video clip that will tell you about the heritage of the Yonglulin School of Medicine. The year was 1900. Singapore's harbours and go-downs swelled with cargo from trading ships from around the world. While the rich enjoyed their mansions, social clubs and suburban estates, the lower classes lived in cramped, unsanitary conditions, which triggered death from diseases like tuberculosis and malaria. While Singapore did have one government hospital, there was still an urgent need for more doctors to serve the local people better. This need was recognized by a remarkable man named Tan Jiak Kim. Born in 1859, Tan Jiak Kim hailed from a prominent Straits Chinese merchant family in Malacca. He was a very passionate Singaporean. From 1890 to 93, he was also an unofficial member of the Legislative Council. That is the law-making body of Singapore. So he had the power and the relationships and the connections with the government to introduce uh, reforms. Tan Jiak Kim fought for the provision of water and better supplies for the street hawkers and the rickshaw pullers. In 1904, he would do more and petition to start Singapore's first medical school. The colonial government agreed to the school's formation on one condition. $71,000 had to be raised. Tan Jiak Kim not only raised the required amount, he exceeded it. Together with various community leaders, a huge sum of $87,000 was collected in just three months. In 1905, the Straits and Federated Malay States Government Medical School was founded at Sepoy Lines, in the location of a former lunatic asylum. It offered a five-year course to train doctors in medicine, surgery and midwifery. It was the first institution of higher learning in Singapore. In fact, the whole history of NUS traces back to the medical school. It was the medical school which allowed the creation of tertiary education. In 1921, it was renamed the King Edward VII College of Medicine. Students came from all over Malaya to become doctors. The school kept growing in size, quality and recognition through the decades. But everything would suddenly change in 1941 when World War II descended upon Singapore. When the war ended, 200 students returned to resume their education. Over the next 50 years, the institution continued to evolve. In 1949, it was renamed the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Malaya, eventually becoming a part of the National University of Singapore and moving to Kentridge in 1983. 
In 1985, the National University Hospital was established, serving as the principal teaching hospital for the school. But another transformation was yet to come. In 2005, a hundred years after Tan Jiak Kim and other community leaders rallied together to kickstart the institution, the NUS Faculty of Medicine celebrated a century of education. That same year, a landmark event would move Singapore's healthcare education to the forefront when the Yong Lu Lin Trust gifted the school with $100 million. This monumental gift created new opportunities for research and training, as well as providing a boost for its infrastructure. So I would say it's truly transformational. The Singapore government matched the gift, so we had an incredible gift become even more incredible. Since 2005, we've had at least three new buildings that have been set up in the campus. And this has allowed us to expand our resources, uh, our facilities for doing uh, groundbreaking research. And it has also allowed us to conduct teaching in much more conducive environments and to try more cutting-edge techniques. The wonderful thing about these transformational gifts is that they don't just provide money for new buildings or facilities. They actually change our view on things. Suddenly our expectations are much higher, our ambitions soar through the roof, and it opens up a whole new horizon for us. We no longer want to be a good medical school in Singapore, we want to be the best in the region and the world. From its pioneering class of just seven students, the School of Medicine has since produced over 10,000 medical professionals, all from an act of giving. At the end of the day, the school is all about people. Uh, it's about our students. We train them to have the right values and motivations, as well as the skills and competencies. It's about our patients that we look at them not only as uh, people with illnesses, but as people with their own lives and priorities, and we should take that into consideration as we care for them. With the continued support from various benefactors, the spirit of philanthropy lives on, growing and giving back to medical excellence. Okay, I hope you found that uh, <clears throat> enlightening. So today, the Young Lulin School of Medicine has um, 17 preclinical and clinical departments and five specialized centers for education. So the preclinical de departments are anatomy, biochemistry, microbiology, pharmacology, and physiology. And this is where you will spend most of your first two years uh, learning about these uh, important areas of uh, knowledge. And then um, you will start to go through the clinical departments from your third year onwards. Uh, so and these are the clinical de departments, of course, including the, the nursing studies, which is uh, the nursing school, basically. For the five uh, specialized centers, they are for behavioral and implementation sciences, biomedical ethics, digital medicine, and medical education. And we have a division of graduate medical studies. So this is a virtual tour of the uh, campus. You can uh, go to this website uh, and um, you know, uh, take the tour yourself. And when you enter the school, you'll be assigned to one of 10 <clears throat> houses, um, all named after uh, important values. And uh, these houses uh, basically, you know, uh, since one class have uh, 300 students, so 30, students will be assigned to each house in the first year. And then uh, in the houses, you have uh, students from all the other years as well. So it'll be 150 students from all five years, plus your house mentors who will guide you. And the purpose of these houses is just so that you have a <clears throat> smaller unit of identity uh, and where you can meet your seniors and they can uh, pass on their wisdom and knowledge to you. And of course, your house mentors are there to guide you. Uh, in 2019, the Singapore's Bicentennial, we launched uh, the uh, NUS uh, school 
<coughs> uh, orchid. So this is the Vanda NUS medicine. Uh, the, the colors of the orchid are a yellow of the hood of the nursing graduate's gown and the red of the medical graduate's gown. And uh, to commemorate that, we also launched the uh, school scarf for our ladies, uh, depicting the Vanda NUS medicine and the special bicentennial edition of the school tie with the lining uh, of the uh, fishing the NUS Vanda medicine. Um, so basically, uh, this is just to commemorate the bicentennial, but every year, uh, as a new class of students enters the school, we will actually create a, a new class scarf and tie for you so that you have a unique uh, school uh, class identity. So you can look forward to receiving that when you enter the school. And I think uh, Brian mentioned that he was <clears throat> in charge of the 2020 rag and flag. So unfortunately, 2020, because of COVID-19, we couldn't have a physical event. But let me show you a video clip from the 2019 Rag and Flag Day. So every uh, year, there'll be a competition where all the different uh, faculties and schools will put up performances. Uh, and uh, NUS Medicine, I'm happy to say, since 2014, we have won the Go Award uh, concept uh, every year. So let me show you what it looks like. So as I said, it's very impressive uh, how the first and second, first year students come in, <clears throat> get go through the orientation, and within a space of a few weeks, come up with a performance like that. Of course, with guidance from their seniors. So this is the school vision, inspiring health for all. And our mission is to nurture doctors and nurses who will choose to care for your loved ones, to develop researchers, seek new knowledge, and deliver solutions for better health, and to serve with humility, compassion, integrity, and respect. So those are our school values, humility, compassion, integrity, and respect. And I think that's something that all of you uh, must have uh, deeply in you if you are to be a good doctor. <clears throat> what, what do we mean by inspiring health for all? So I guess it starts off with medical education in the school, where we hope to give you insight to study, experience, and service uh, to help you to learn to inquire by observation, experimentation, and seeking to explain and then to innovate, to identify uh, your shortfalls, try to improve them, and then to make sure that it can be implemented. And for health, we are going beyond disease, beyond medicine, to the delivery of healthcare, uh, preferably le uh, leveraging on modern technology. And when we talk about health, we are talking about going beyond health, beyond disease to health. So prevention, health promotion, human potential. And we have to do all that in, in the health system. So we understand the infrastructures required, the transitions or the handovers from, say, hospital to community, and also understanding uh, that resources are limited and we have to have a good grasp of economics to make the best use of our resources. And finally, all starting with uh, pay our patients, they have to be the center of everything we do, uh, and we have to treat them as persons with their own special circumstances. So we need to know their, their, their own environment uh, and the circumstances that in which they function uh, and which you know, they have to deal with the disease or the health problems that they have. And of course, we want to always uh, be able to uh, do everything in the com for the community. Uh, and we have surveyed the community health, engage community so that they will practice the right health behaviors. And finally, it all starts from yourself. You have to have the right values so that you will practice the right kind of medicine. Uh, you have to have resilience and determination to carry through what you start 
And finally, a curiosity to keep, continue improving and learning throughout your lives. So in a school, we do make use of uh, technology significantly. So we teach you human anatomy using virtual reality. Uh, we have a very high fidelity healthcare simulation laboratories where you can uh, practice your skills before you try them on real patients. Uh, and we have uh, also uh, an AI platform for you to have uh, to practice your history taking in patients with virtual integrated patients. And uh, finally, we have a platform for you to learn health economics as well. So going beyond that, uh, we have uh, various, various pathways for health informatics, behavioral and implementation science inquiry and thinking health and humanity because Medicine is not only about disease or technology, it's about very much the human uh, person. And having, you know, uh, understanding this deeply uh, is critical for you to be a good doctor. The other thing that we were introducing this year is the, uh, is the intercalated year program. So in the third or fourth year of your medical school, you can choose to take a gap year for your medical studies and do a master's of science by research or a master's in public health. So the idea is that, um, yes, you add one year to your uh, five years of medical school, but when you graduate, you will not only have your uh, bachelor's degree in medicine and surgery, you will have a master's degree either in research or in public health. So this is only for the top students uh, in each year. Only five students are allowed to uh, sign up for this program. Um, and um, we, we, we think this would be quite a, great thing uh, to help our students uh, master a new skill uh, that will help them in their medical career. So in Singapore's healthcare system uh, is facing challenges. This is the Ministry of Health's 2020 vision. Basically because of the aging, fast aging population, increasing chronic uh, diseases like uh, diabetes and hypertension, slower population growth, and because of that slower workforce growth, rising healthcare costs, this is all going to be put a big squeeze on the Singapore healthcare system. So the Minister of Health has recognized the need to go beyond, basically beyond healthcare to health, uh, beyond hospital to community, and beyond quality to value. So, and, and so these are challenges we have to deal with. And how are we preparing you for that? First of all, we recognize that different uh, generations of people uh, you know, are different, right? So most of the staff uh, that you meet in our school or the graduate students will be millennials, born since 1980. And then you are part of the Generation Z, or what I like to call the post-millennials, born since 97. Um, and basically you have different uh, values uh, and priorities from myself. I, I, I guess I'm a baby boomer. So, um, I, I think uh, your generation expects the use of technology everywhere, especially mobile technology. Uh, you tend to be different from us uh, in, in your values um, and, and the way you learn. So for you, the curriculum will be one where that's digital, that's data-driven technology at hearts, that is sustainable in terms of being grounded in values and so that you always have a moral compass. Uh, and as well as value driven. So because we know that resources are scarce and we have to care about the environment. And we want to give you an authentic experiential curriculum uh, that uh, can hone your idealism as well as making you pragmatic. And finally, medic studying medicine is a lifelong journey. So you have to have maintain your curiosity to continuously learn. So as I mentioned, value is very important to us. Uh, and we will try and uh, help you develop this uh, as you go through our medical school, through our silent mentors program, through our longitudinal patient experience, team training, through having the right role models and service in the community. So we, it's important that you do have a heart for service uh, to help other people. Um, and we, our students do this through their own student initiatives. So all these community services you hear have been running for a long time. And they were all initiated by our students uh, and just supported by the school, but basically the own ideas of the students uh, that has managed to be, uh, to be implemented in the community very successfully. And we don't just do this in Singapore, we uh, also go beyond our borders to the ASEAN region, Cambodia, Myanmar, and so forth, uh, to you know, uh, 
first of all, to get a, to experience a different uh, environment uh, and to meet needs where they are. And you know, of course, COVID nineteen has made uh, made travel uh, impossible. So, but we can still do a lot of what we uh, should do through Zoom uh, channels. And finally, uh, we've just launched uh, the school manga. So it's called White Coat Tales. Uh, it's a man manga or comic about uh, five uh, students who go through admissions and then go through all five years of the school. And I think you'll find that uh, the settings they're in are real ones uh, and experiences they face are very much real ones as well. So if you go to uh, the NUS Med Shop, uh, you can use this promo code um, open house 2021 to get this manga at uh, less than half the price at nine dollars. But if otherwise, you can go to the Epigram, uh, which is the publisher's Epigram bookstore, uh, to get this manga at a usual price of eighteen dollars ninety cents. And I'm sure you'll be able to find it in bookshops uh, around Singapore from time to time. So uh, I, I I found it very uh, uh, enjoyable, and hope that you will too. So. Basically, the Yong Lunin School of Medicine, 116 years of history, over 10,000 graduates and alumni, number 19 in the world, number one in Asia. Uh, it's a good place to be. So, but wherever you choose to go to study medicine, I hope that you will seek to become doctors who cure sometimes, relieve often, and comfort always, and question constantly, and learn throughout your lives. So with that, thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, I do hope to see you joining the NUS family shortly. Uh, these are some websites you can go to to find out more about uh, NUS. And these are some of our COVID-19 chronicles, which I hope you've seen, uh, which is our way to help educate the public. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dean, for the very insightful and comprehensive sharing of our medical school. As if I may add, I mean, the emphasis on rich values our school also emphasizes on a very rich experience. As you can see what our Dean shared, there is something for everyone, whatever your palate is. But even as Dean has shared a lot and may have answered some of your questions, I believe his sharing may have also invoked many questions. So at this point, I would like you to also invite you to actually go to our Q&A function, uh, to as, as put in your questions, and, and we'll tackle some of these questions when we go to the Q&A segment uh, later on in this program. But right now, I would like to switch gear and let us hear from our newly minted graduate, Dr. Teo Jin Hao, as he reminiscent his past five years in the medical school. Jin Hao, over to you, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jin Hao. Um, I'm a fresh graduate from NUS Medicine. I just graduated last year. I'm currently working as a first year house officer right now. And I'm very honored to be here with everyone today to share on my experiences with NUS Medicine, as well as to you know, really um, share with everyone how NUS Medicine has prepared me uh, to be a uh, Singaporean doctor. Uh, and hopefully through my sharing, I hope that um, it will give you more insight into why uh, you should choose NUS Medicine as a, your school of choice. So while preparing for my presentation, I thought of, uh, I, I identified three main reasons why I felt that, you know, looking back, NUS Medicine was, uh, has really prepared me very well to be a, a doctor in Singapore. Um, firstly, I it, I realized that you know, NUS Medicine has a great education system and a syllabus, um, precisely because the people crafting our, our education framework and our syllabus uh, and at the forefront of, um, our, of teaching us are the same doctors who are experienced clinicians in the hospitals and who know exactly what we need to know to be safe and effective and competent doctors in the future. And with these doctors setting our syllabus, setting our assessments and guiding and training us every step of the way, um, I felt that you know whatever I learned in medical school is was directly and very immediately relevant to uh, to my daily work as a as a doctor in practice, um, and also in NUS medicine we have many um, different uh, pedagogies and teaching methods um, such as interactive lectures with live quizzes. We have small group tutorials um, with with multiple tutors. Um, we also have like uh, sessions where we get to go down to the microbiology lab to look at specimens under slides. Uh, we get to have anatomy hall sessions where we can learn from um, people who have donated the bodies from medical school in person. Um, we also even have pathology pods where we can look at specimens of human organs um, which have been preserved. 
uh, to, to learn from directly rather than you know just looking at um, them as images on online or through apps which may not be as interactive as uh, doing it in real life. Um, and from year three to year five, uh, we also get to be posted to every single government restructured hospital in Singapore. Uh, we get to interact with patients, we get to learn from doctors who are on the ground and uh, have met, we get many lectures and tutorials in hospitals themselves. So I, I, I thought that, you know, um, looking back these five years in NUS Medicine, uh, in terms of the syllabus wise, in terms of our clinical exposure, it really, it was very relevant and really prepared me very well uh, for starting work in, in, in Singapore. Um, the second reason that I, I, I found how NUS has really prepared me to you know, be a house officer uh, and, and to be a doctor in Singapore is that it really gave me um, unparalleled exposure to both our workplace as well as our patients and our fellow Singaporeans. Um, and I say so because you know, I, I personally feel that at the end of the day, um, being a good doctor is not just about having content knowledge, but it also requires a good understanding of how our, our Singaporeans, our health systems and our hospitals work. And a good medical school is one that can not only give you knowledge, but also help you understand um, our, our local populace uh, as well as our hospital, uh, hospital structures and our healthcare policies well. And also, you know how um, uh, Singaporeans may, uh, may think about their medical conditions, uh, what kind of health-seeking behaviours they may, they may tend to have, what kind of practices they may tend to have, and how to identify any pitfalls in these. So over, over in Singapore, uh, oh, oh, sorry, over in NUS Medicine, uh, I, I felt that as a student, um, I really got a lot of experience. Uh, the school really gave me a lot of experience in preparing me uh, for, for, for working life, basically, um, and, and to you know, be familiar with how hospitals work. Um, as a student from year three onwards, we get to participate in morning rounds with the various teams you're posted with. Um, we get to see the patients uh, in the morning. We get to see the new admissions who come in overnight. Um, and we get, to, we get to speak to them beforehand, examine them, and then present our findings and our impression, um, as well as our, our plans to the team consultant. And then um, from that, the consultants will usually give us feedback, and then we can learn on the go. Um, we, we also get to help out and uh, take part in bedside procedures. We get to go on night calls with our seniors, our house officers, medical officers who are already working. And we also get to like practice making referrals to different subspecialties uh, for, for the patients that we see. Um, also as a student, uh, we get to work with our uh, different allied health professionals, the nurses, the therapists, and, and to take part in all these sessions which uh, are important for our patients' uh, treatment and recovery. And, you know, I felt that, you know, being exposed to all these opportunities as a student uh, made me a lot more ready for when I started work, you know, so that I, I, I know exactly, like, who I need to refer to uh, for my patient to get better. I know where to find what I need to find. Um, and, and on the first day of work, it was, things weren't so jarring for me. Um, also, I, I felt that, you know, uh, Within, within medical school, as uh, Prof Chong has also shared, um, in, in, in NUS Medicine especially, we have more than 30 community service projects um, with, which provide us, which provide any student uh, with a range and a variety of uh, community service opportunities uh, to, with different uh, underprivileged or underserved groups in Singapore. And in, during my student years, I also um, had the privilege of uh, being part of a few community service projects myself. And, you know, through all these projects, I really got to understand how um, people uh, think and, and, and the, the reasons why certain, be, uh, certain patients may behave or act or think the way they do. Uh, and I, I felt and initially in my medical school years, that didn't really, it didn't really occur to me how important that was. But as I started work, I realized that, you know, these experiences were really uh, quite invaluable. So if I may share, I think one of the, one of the most um, the, the most memorable incidents uh, as a year two medical student when I took part uh, in the neighborhood health service, uh, which offers a free health screening uh, for under, underprivileged and underserved residents in rental flats, uh, was that there was this uncle, uh, he was, I think he was in his 70s or 80s, uh, not very aware of his medical conditions, um, had, had high blood pressure, uh, supposed to be taking medications. Uh, and when we, when we were doing just a routine blood pressure check for him, we found out that his blood pressure was 200. Uh, and, and that's not a good number to be at. We want it to be, you know, uh, 120s to 130s. And so when I found out that, you know, his blood pressure was 200, I, I, was, I was shocked. And so I asked him, you know, uncle, uh, how come your blood pressure is so high? Are you nervous when you see me? Or, you know, have you not been taking your medications? And so this uncle told me, oh yeah, I haven't been taking my medicine. You know, I, I haven't been taking it for four months, in fact, because uh, I just ran out of supply. 
And so, you know, as a naive year two medical student, my first instinctive response to him was, oh, uncle, how come you never take your medicine? You know, your blood, your blood pressure is so high now. And you know, if your blood pressure is high, then it will be bad for your heart. You may get a stroke. You might even die. You know, you should take your medicine. Uh, and how come you, you, are, you, you, you have not been taking it? And how come you haven't even been going to get a resupply? And so his reply to me was, boy, you look at my leg. I've had one amputation and I'm in a wheelchair and I have no one taking care of me at home. I can't even leave the house. How am I supposed to go to the hospital to get a refill of my medications? And then it struck me. I realized that, you know, when, when as a medical professional or medical professional to be, um, it is very easy for us to, you know, identify a medical condition, to know what needs to be done about it. And, uh, and, yeah, and, and to, you know, to tell people um, what needs to be done. If you have high blood pressure, you should just take your medicine. And if you take your medicine and blood pressure is under control, uh, you will be healthy. You will have a, a good life. But I think a lot of times we fail to realize that uh, beyond uh, that, there are many other factors that influence and affect a, a person's um, thoughts and their behaviors about their own health. Uh, for example, why, why, what are some reasons, you know, uh, someone might not want to take their medications other than just, you know, ignorance? Um, what if they, they can't even leave their house? What if they have problems walking? What if they, are, they have no money to even, you know, take public transport to go to the nearest polyclinic? Uh, or what if, you know, they don't even know what buses or what trains they can take to get to the, poly, the nearest clinic or where the nearest clinic is? It's easy for someone to, you know, call ambulance to be sent to the hospital. But, you know, on discharge, when we tell them to follow at the polyclinic, um, how many of them actually know where to go and how to go and, you know, uh, uh, and, and when exactly the appointment is. So uh, something I also realized that, you know, a lot of our patients, when they go to hospitals uh, and they're discharged, they're given an appointment. Usually these appointments are sent by SMS and the SMSs are sent in English. But a lot of our elderly population don't understand English. They understand Malay, Tamil, uh, Chinese. And when they receive the SMS, if they even have a handphone, uh, it's in English. Some of, like 50, 60% of them don't even, um, can't even read the SMS. How would they know that, you know, they need to even go for the appointment? And, you know, so through, through all these experiences, communities of experiences that I had in medical school, it really showed me, um, you know, all, all these challenges and all these obstacles to health and healthcare that um, our Singaporeans face. And, you know, uh, I, I, looking back, it really has given me a greater understanding and appreciation of, uh, of, of my patients today. La. And, you know, when, when I have new admissions, when I speak to them, I find out more about why they have not been taking the medications or why certain conditions are not as well controlled as we would like them to be. Then, you know, these are some things that at least I can ask for, look out for, and, you know, to, to help correct, la, to get the necessary social services on board if need to. So, um, and I, 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 I'm... I'm really thankful that, you know, NUS Medicine has given me these opportunities to, to, to learn so much about um, our community. Um, finally, I also think that, you know, um, in NUS, um, pre-COVID times, uh, we had an extensive and a very comprehensive elective program. Uh, our, our School of Medicine partners with uh, universities, medical schools all over the world, uh, where our own students get to go overseas to go on elective programs um, in areas uh, where we are potentially interested in. Uh, so in my, in my, during my time, I went to Taiwan and Vietnam and got to take part, uh, help assist in even a few surgeries uh, while I was there and posted to the surgical department. Yeah, and so um, my third and final reason for, you know, why I think NUS Medicine has really, really prepared me uh, for starting work as a Singaporean doctor is that, you know, I read, at the end of the day, the people you meet in medical school, not just your batchmates, but also your seniors and your juniors now, are definitely going to be your colleagues in future. Um, and there's no running away from that, especially if you come into the medical school, which produces the highest proportion of um, fresh graduates every year. Um, as Prof Chong has mentioned, uh, our, our, every batch is split into 10 houses, which where you go for lectures together. Uh, and we also split into clinical groups, smaller groups of uh, students, five to six or six to seven students, uh, which go for tutorials together, as well as uh, to for clinical postings together. And the, the houses and the clinical groups tend to be made up of different people. Uh, and so that gives, gives you a lot of opportunity to meet new people. Uh, on top of, you know, uh, joining community service projects, joining other school events, uh, initiatives. And also, I, I think another strong point of NUS Medicine is that we have, we have a very strong senior teacher junior, as well as peer-to-peer -peer learning initiatives. And... Uh, 
tradition. So one of the things that you will get, you will be exposed to when you come to NUS Medicine is that uh, every year we have this Senior Teach Junior Initiative where basically uh, as a year one student, your year two seniors who have just been through what you've been through one year ago, uh, will organize like revision sessions for you um, close to your exams to help you run through and revise uh, and help you, you know, really uh, solidify what you've learned about certain topics. And for these year two seniors, their year three seniors will do the same for them. For the year three is the year fours and for the year fours, the year fives. Uh, who have just been in their shoes one year ago. And so this, these are also a lot of opportunities in which we get to uh, meet, uh, meet our seniors as well as to uh, meet uh, juniors who, uh, and, and guide them along the way. And eventually when we start work, you know, these are the same people who are going to be your seniors and juniors in the workplace. And they are going to be the same people you know, who will be uh, working alongside you when you start work. So uh, like now, now that I've started work, I realized that, you know, um, the very friends that I've made in medical school are also the same people who are, you know, on call with me during um, code blues, during resuscitations, you know, when patients fall very sick and they need to be seen in the ward. Um, and these are also the same people uh, who will be there for you, you know, when uh, you have 10 new admissions to see in the morning and only one hour to see all of them. Uh, when you have many um, scans to call for, you have families to update, you have discharge summaries to do, when you have many things to do. These are the same people who have been through the same training and have the same... Um, thought process and clinical reasoning as you who can easily understand what you need and how, how they can help you and help you uh, efficiently and effectively. And uh, looking back, I, uh, I, I feel that, you know, having met so many people from my batch and having worked with so many of them before and being able to work with these very same people as a house officer now um, has really made uh, working as a house officer very enjoyable and a very smooth sailing. And uh, looking back, I, I don't think I would have chosen uh, things any differently. Uh, I'm really thankful that, uh, that I had the chance to uh, go through uh, medical education with NUS. Yeah. So in summary, I, I, I think that NUS Medicine has really prepared me to be a, a, a doctor in Singapore because it has a great education system and syllabus because of the exposure it gives us uh, to patients, to Singaporeans as well as to the workplace, and also because of the many friends and colleagues that um, I've, I've made along the way. Yeah. So with that, I've come to the end of my sharing. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Jin Hao. Thank you for sharing. And, and, and I'm really glad you had a fantastic experience. Uh, let me hold on for a while as I sort out the iPad and for the subsequent segment on Q&A. But I would actually go a little bit you know, uh, further and even say that and, and noted your perspective on a strong uh, senior teach junior culture and a strong peer-to-peer -peer, uh, teaching. I would say that as a faculty, sometimes even my students teach me a thing or two. And, and I must say that I learn a lot from my students as well. So, so I think that's something that, that I think uh, is a unique feature of our education curriculum, where there's a strong partnership uh, between student to student, uh, as well as between student and faculty. All right, so give me a couple of seconds as my colleague uh, will actually sort out the iPad for the Q&A segment. But having said that, even as my colleague is sorting that out, I've looked at some of the questions from a Q&A and perhaps I, I will try my best to recall from memory some of the questions. I believe one of the first questions that came through the Q&A was, you know, can you tell me a little bit more uh, about the medical curriculum and what is, what is it like uh, post-medical school? By post-medical school, I assume the one who's asking a question is referring to what's next after medical school and not, you know, what, 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 what's at the end of the day after a hard day in school. So what are your thoughts? And maybe I can talk a bit more about the preclinical year. So year one and year two uh, in NUS Medicine. So in year one, you learn uh, what's considered normal uh, structure and function. So what is the normal human body supposed to uh, the anatomy, the physiology, all the functions inside. And then year two, you cover more the, of the abnormal structure and function. So like pathology, what uh, derangements can you have that can go wrong? And how can we perhaps to um, address it using our medical interventions? And that kindly leads us into our third to fifth year regarding the clinical years. So maybe Arvin can like talk about more about that. So in your third year of medical school, you are exposed to the basics of uh, medical education. So things like internal medicine, general surgery, orthopedics, and family medicine. And whereas in your fourth year, you're introduced, introduced to a lot more subspecialty topics such as psychology, 
uh, ENT, eye, and uh, emergency medicine. And this really helps to round out your perspective and how you get to see the various different aspects of medical education. Before in year five, you round out with a few more smaller postings like dermatology, infectious diseases, before your preparation for MBBS actually begins. Any thoughts from the faculty on our curriculum? Well, if I may, may, may share, I think we actually have a fairly robust curriculum uh, that has been tested and tried over the years. Um, and we do use a full range of different teaching styles and techniques. Um, we have interactive lectures. We have a number of like tutorials. Uh, the collaborative learning cases are a very good way of bringing home uh, the realities of the clinical medicine, but still grounded on the basic science principles. Uh, and I think the students also enjoy the early patient experiences in year one and two. So I, I think we've had a, a very varied and rich uh, exposure, both from a nice combination of didactics, interactive and patient uh, experiences. And I think we also have the fortunate of having the simulation center whereby we both have simulation from the point of a real uh, patient standardized patients in simulation as well as using technology for simulation and even now with the virtual reality and AI. So I think our students in a sense are in uh, you know in a time whereby they have the technology is now available for us to use to enhance learning. All right, thank you very much Mary. Uh, speaking of reality, Prof. Suresh, you know the guru of the simulation. <laughs> So I, 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 I echo what uh, Siong and uh, Marin has mentioned. I think uh, the approach uh, of the school is uh, to have a more integrated uh, approach to the curriculum where we try to introduce uh, clinical aspects of medicine um, uh, early, uh, right from year one. In fact, uh, within the first year uh, in medical school, our medical students are exposed to real-life patients in a real-life authentic clinical environment. Uh, and this is where they start uh, learning and, and they start understanding what it is uh, actually uh, to be a doctor and to practice the doctor in the future. Um, at the end of the day, uh, of course, we expect our students to actually interact with real life patients, uh, but uh, you know, unprecedented uh, situations like the COVID uh, pandemic has uh, led us uh, to explore other areas. And during the past year, we uh, used other methodologies to expose uh, our, our students and still maintain the high standards uh, that we expect in the medical school. So, for example, simulation, virtual reality, uh, these are all the technologies that uh, we use uh, to make sure that our students uh, do not uh, you know, lose out in terms of acquiring clinical medicine. Thank you, Professor Suresh. I mean, we've heard a lot about the, the, the bread and butter of medical and surgical training. But the medical curriculum, it's also, uh, uh, there's a lot of things at the periphery or at the boundaries that are just as important that will ultimately make you future ready as, as a doctor of the 21st century. And I wonder if, if Caitlin, you might have any experience on, on some of this learning. All right, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to share about that. So um, in my first two years of uh, medical school, I was concurrently enrolled as a non-graduating student in the school's university scholars program. So that's a program based in University Town, uh, which is an interdisciplinary academic program where um, you know, students from different faculties uh, get together, live together even, uh, and we go through classes in you know, things that are everything, basically. So in my first two years, I took a class in writing, I took a class in emotional psychology, and I also did an independent study module on uh, intergenerational perceptions of depression in Singapore. And I think, you know, um, this exposure to things that were not directly related to medicine helped me to really understand my patients in a different way and to sort of reflect better on my experiences throughout the years in medical school. So even though these were, you know, classes that I took in my first two years of school, even now as a clinical year student, a lot of the lessons that I learned back in USP still stick with me till now. Uh, and even just the connections that you make with people from faculties other than your own, you know, it makes you see the bigger picture behind what a patient goes through. So things like the healthcare system, uh, health economics, uh, psychological barriers to seeking treatment and whatnot. So that was very beneficial for me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Caitlin. As you heard from um, Caitlin and uh, our Dean Prof Chong mentioned about uh, the, the need for the broadening of the curriculum. So 
uh, should some of you join us, there are many opportunities for you to learn about many things that are important to the bread and butter of medicine that are and, and, and both in-house as well as outside of the medical school. And also many opportunities to interact with students from the other parts of the university as well. And one example is the Medical Grand Challenge, for example, where our students uh, collaborate with students from other faculties like engineering and arts, for example, to solve a healthcare problem or to create an innovation that will benefit patients. And so speaking of things that learning things on the fringe, there's another question that came through. Um, do the overseas community projects offer credits for the curriculum or are these just purely for volunteerism? Well, I'll be happy to take that question. So right now, um, in my capacity in the Medical Society, I'm serving as the Director for Community Service. So um, I do oversee quite a lot of these overseas uh, community involvement projects, as well as the local projects. So um, to answer that question directly, they do not count for credit. Um, what our school believes in and what our students all believe in is that you know, all these extracurricular um, service initiatives should really just be because we see that there is a need which we believe we can fill uh, and we hope to do the best we can in serving this uh, area as much as we can. Yeah, so um, it's not counted for credit, though we do have guidance from the school. Um, so, for instance, Dr. Chen is running, uh, helping to oversee the school's Global Health and Leadership Program, which does provide uh, mentorship and funding support to projects which are run by students. Uh, I'm really not doing anything uh, other than just signing off and say, you know, all the best and have, you know, <laughs> and serve the community. It's really, um, you know, by students and, and for students. Yeah, thank you very much, Caitlin. Anything else to add, perhaps from... Uh... Sure, I can talk about a bit more about my time in Project Sabai. So Project Sabai is a, a overseas community involvement program that's based in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. So the large part of Project Sabai is actually about setting up free clinics across different areas in Phnom Penh to reach out to all the um, underprivileged or uh, villagers who, are, who may not be able to afford uh, medical care at their own public hospitals. So one of the issues over there is actually that we've been trying to tackle over the past few years is actually the high rate of tuberculosis in the, in the Cambodian community. However, this is, uh, requires a lot of um, help also from the Cambodian hospitals. So we've also been doing a lot of um, uh, legislation and like trying to work with the uh, com community hospitals in Cambodia to see what we can do to work together with them to reduce the rate of tuberculosis in Cambodia. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Brian. It's like you've done a lot of stuff. And uh, maybe I'll just add on a little bit by saying that um, I think in the medical school, there's a, there's really, you can really see that our students are, are really doing things that they are passionate about and really interested in. And, and, and having said that, of course, uh, there's a strong culture whereby we never take our faculty of students for granted. And they are always, even if they do not come for credits officially, there are some ways where we try to encourage, support, or actually recognize our students through, through various platforms where they can actually showcase their work and, and actually bring it to, to a much bigger platform. All right, let's move on to the next question. Um, this goes, does the SJT only have medical situations like the UK ones? How do you recommend us to prepare for the SJT portion of the interview? At this point, I'm looking there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I'm sure all of you are interested to know what might come out. So I want to reassure you uh, that all the scenarios in the SJT are actually non-medical. Okay, so there no medical, you don't need any medical knowledge at all uh, for them. They're basically life situations and life scenarios. Uh, and we've pitched it really at what we expect an uh, 18 or 20 year old person to have experienced. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer, but basically we ask you to respond in the way you would do if you were to face this situation in real life. So not, not to worry, no medical uh, content at all. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Marin. Anything to add, Prof. Suresh? Oh. Yeah, I think uh, we are looking for candidates um, who have um, a broad view of uh, life in general uh, because we know that uh, uh, every applicant to the school, um, you, have, you are the best of uh, the lot. 
So we have no uh, doubt in your knowledge ability. So as Mary mentioned, uh, you don't really have to read up or you don't have to study any guides. Uh, neither um, would you uh, need to go for any courses uh, online or otherwise uh, to prepare for this. So come as you are, be honest, be sincere, and uh, most of you will be all right. Yeah, you just need to be yourself. All right, thank you very much, Prof Suresh. Okay, the next question. Would you recommend someone who has no biology background in JC to take medicine? Maybe I'll ask um, Arvin, Caitlin and Brian. Do you take JC or no JC? No biology. Do you take biology or no biology? So for myself, uh, I did take biology in JC. But what I've come to realize in the, my four years in medical school so far is that the, having the background knowledge of biology, while it does provide a little bit of benefit in that some of the terms are very familiar to you, the things that we actually learn in your preclinical years are on a whole other level from what we've uh, experienced in JC. So, I mean, in a, in a sense, everyone is equally lost. But for those who are worried that, you know, uh, taking, having taken physics or not having taken biology sets you back, uh, rest assured, the, we actually have a lot of senior teach junior sessions whereby some of the year two medical students actually come back and help to teach the year one students who didn't take, don't have a biology background. They teach them the, like some of the basics and the fundamentals so that they are also on a level playing field as everyone else. So we do have these kind of uh, programs in place so that everyone uh, can be more assured about uh, before they start their education here. Anyone, anyone else wants to add anything? Yeah, sure. I might adding on. So actually, uh, to elaborate further on this senior teach junior culture, which is actually very, very strong in Yonglulin, it's actually, we actually even have this thing called a biology bridging course that's been run by all of uh, EDU team. So it's run all by purely medical students of higher M's. And they come back to teach the M1s who have no uh, biology background to come and help them. Okay, what is a cell? What is all these kind of basic biology functions that definitely would need to understand, to understand the preclinical sciences. And definitely along the way, rest be assured, all your biology uh, friends will help you even if you have no biology background. I can really remember during one of the early lectures regarding cell structure and function, which is basically a six week course in JC, became a one hour lecture in medical school. And definitely you can definitely feel very lost and feel very like out of touch with what's happening. And be rest be assured that all your friends will be there to help you along the way. Thank you very much, uh, Brian and Arvin. And indeed, this BBC course, all right, don't, don't worry, you know, some of you might think like, oh, you know, is, is it legit? Are, are, are those knowledge sound? Um, the students are amazing, to be honest. I'm very touched and very warm as a faculty because the students actually approach some of our colleagues, for example, uh, to check in with them on, on, on some of these causes, whether the, the content is sound, whether the concepts are, 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 are legitimate, so to speak, and, and the students actually come to create questions that they can help their peers and, and together co-creating. Again, the emphasis here is co-creation between the faculty and the students. But I think that there's something what the students articulated that really underscores this spirit of wanting to help one another in the school. Right. So if you come in, it's not about, oh, I don't have biology and, and someone else has biology. And, and therefore, you know, I, I felt uh, like I'm a little bit disadvantaged as someone has a, has, has a sort of a advantage. But really, it is about people, you know, trying to help one another to get through these five years together. All right. So that's something that you can surely experience when you come here. Let us move on to the next question. Are there any pathways post medical school for doctors who are interested in pursuing research? example, molecular or clinical research. If there is, is this a viable endeavor balancing between research and patient care? Yeah. So, I mean, this is somebody who's thinking quite far ahead. Um, definitely there are opportunities for research and you can be involved in research either as we call it on the site, on top of your job, uh, or you could actually pursue a formal, like a PhD. Uh, so definitely it would be tough to actually practice because you hold a full-time clinical job and at the same time spend extra time doing research. Uh, depending on whether you take up postgraduate training, uh, some postgraduate training programs actually do have some time ring fence or built into the program for research training. So you can have some formal time recognized for research, uh, but it really depends on uh, which program uh, you are in. 
So short answer, yes, uh, there are, but there's, uh, you would need to sort of discuss that with your supervisors. Yeah. Did you go through any research during your time? Mm, I think I can share a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so personally, I'm not doing um, molecular research, but I am doing some degree of research uh, on the side while juggling my clinical studies. So I think it is very uh, possible. I think the good thing about being in this school is that you have access to many people who are good mentors. So for myself, I'm working with a public health mentor and that's where I'm channeling my energy. But I do know several peers who are in touch with um, mentors, whether from the hospitals or from NUS, um, other departments in NUS or other departments in the School of Medicine in NUS as well, uh, who are doing uh, research as undergraduates. And I just want to add on as well, uh, the culture of uh, getting students to join uh, in research projects actually starts from quite uh, early on. Even in M1, even if you have no uh, clinical background in research, uh, there are still projects and openings available for students to join and cultivate these skills early on so that when you start to enter your clinical years, you can actually start to take on a heavier and larger uh, involvement in uh, research projects. And as Caitlin mentioned, the avenues to join research projects in medical school aren't just limited to faculty members, any doctors that you meet along the, your journey in the hospitals, if you can strike up a good relationship with them, if they can offer you places and you can ask for to join them on research programs as well. And the school itself does offer a sort of matching service for interested students who may not uh, be aware of who is the right person to ask or, or which doctor do I go to if I'm uh, interested in a research in a particular field. The school offers uh, matching services and uh, provides uh, and links up interested students with the right uh, doctors as well. Exactly, and indeed we are excellent matchmakers when we come to that. Uh, personally, I, I've, I've been matchmaking students to supervisors and I uh, love that job. And uh, I think maybe I'll just kind of summarize what I've heard from my colleague as well as his students. I think moving forward in the, in the future, all right, you, have, you can imagine there are doctors, doctors, there are doctors, scientists, they are doctors, educators, they are doctors, innovators, and, and entrepreneurs. And I think the school is definitely taking the right steps and the right direction in recognizing the need for this differentiation, differentiation and also recognizing the need that many of you who are going to join NUS Medicine, while you're coming here to become doctors, you also carry with you different strengths and different interests. And the school is definitely very keen to actually try and understand what are those interests and strengths that you might have and, and actually work together to develop and, 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 and let those unleash those opportunities, uh, those potential in you with opportunities. All right. So that's something that I'll just, you know, in a broad stroke, talk about the research. Let us look at the next question. Do you accept international students who obtain their diploma in nursing, either in NYP or Nian? Or is there any other requirements besides the diploma? Okay, so I think it depends. Um, definitely students who have already graduated from another program uh, can apply to medicine. Uh, there might be some uh, criteria in the sense that if they've already been funded for one graduate, pro I mean one graduate program, uh, then one possibility is for them to consider the Duke uh, NUS, which is a graduate medical school. Uh, if they want to apply for a second undergraduate program in Singapore, then there might be some things that we need to find out in terms of uh, funding because all education for Singaporeans is funded by the Ministry of Education. So there might be some implications with regards to the education grant that you can qualify for if you're actually doing another undergraduate degree. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Marin. All right. I hope that answered your question. There's a very interesting question with uh, quite a number of thumbs up. And uh, I think this, you know, many of you will be eager to answer this. What does being a junior doctor, medical student entail? Are there times, oh, it just went off. All right. Are there times when you felt like giving up and how did you pull through? Maybe, uh, maybe I can answer that question as the, the, the most senior medical student here. I, I think the role of a medical student is one of uh, observation and uh, learning mainly. So I think the most important thing to think about that when you're in a medical student and you're, and you're given the privilege to be part of the medical team taking care of a patient, it's very important to observe uh, what is going on because you learn 
by uh, by a system of apprenticeship, by observing what the senior, what your senior doctors are doing, and then you come back to them and you ask them questions. So it's very important to be very observant about what you see, and that is just when you are interacting with your medical team. Most of the time, as a uh, medical student, you are left alone in the wards and in the clinics, and it's up to you to have the initiative to go find patients, to go to speak patients, and strike that rapport with them. So it's very important that you're not afraid to strike up uh, conversations with patients as well. I think to answer the second part of that question, I think there are times in everyone's medical school journey whereby they sometimes feel that the odds are against them, that the pressures are very overwhelming. I think uh, everyone here, we are always, we're always very surrounded by other very competent individuals and everyone has their, has their moments where they don't feel adequate enough. And I think uh, something that needs to be talked about more often in general is that having these feelings are okay and it's not... Uh, it's not a shameful thing to feel inadequate. And I think uh, the school has done a very good job of opening up these barriers and allowing conversations like this to happen. And it makes these things normalized. And, it, and because these things are normalized, we are then able to uh, help our students who need uh, any support, any form of counseling, uh, any form of assistance. So I think uh, for me personally, yes, uh, in, the, uh, in the past two, uh, two years of clinical edu uh, uh, education, uh, there are times where you know you do feel like giving up. You feel that sometimes the content, uh, you know, it just doesn't make sense, uh, or you don't understand it, or you're not able to apply it. But I think it's very important to be able to speak frankly and candidly to your friends, to some maybe sometimes educators who are able to provide a listening ear, and that really does take a load off your shoulder because sometimes the thing, the easiest thing to forget is that you're not the only one going through this, lah. Yeah, I mean, like Caitlin and Brian to share as well. Yeah, sure. I think um, the thing about medical school, um, which I think makes it very different from any other undergraduate or even graduate course, is that it's a very universal experience. Um, I can say this because I have many friends who are not medical students. And, you know, for instance, my friends who study geography, one geography student and another geography student have very different paths um, because they choose different modules. Whereas in medical school, we're all really studying the same thing. We're going through the same experiences in the wards. We're meeting patients. We're meeting other doctors together. And I think um, with that, there's really a sense of camaraderie um, that is forged. I think in terms of you know feeling challenged and wanting to give up, definitely that happens. Uh, and like what Avin said, I think it's knowing that this is a universal experience that makes you realize that this is just part of the journey. Um, I think for someone who's considering coming to medical school, I think the key is just to be aware that it will be challenging, um, but that it being challenging is for a bigger purpose at the end of the day. Yeah. All right. Maybe Brian is a little bit uh, too early in his medical curriculum to give up, but perhaps Jin Hao, uh, you know, he, he, I don't know, Jin Hao, are you giving up already? Let's hear from Jin Hao. Okay. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm definitely not giving up uh, yet and haven't given up. Um, but I think there were, uh, throughout my student years and um, ever since I started work, there have been many times where, um, uh, you know, uh, thoughts did cross my mind la, as to, you know, why is it so uh, challenging being a doctor? And there were times where I questioned whether you have um, for this job. La. Uh, both in my, I mean, uh, I don't think I was a very good, uh, very the best of students or a, a role model that people should emulate. Uh, I, I, I wasn't really the kind that can like sit down for like five, six hours to, to study nonstop. I, I need to like move around, take breaks all the time and things like that. Um, so as a student, I really kind of struggled with, you know, um, uh, mugging and cramming content knowledge uh, a lot of the times and I think even as I started work um, you know um, there will be times where you are just so swamped with work to do with scans to call for families to update discharge discharge summaries to do um, and there, there were many times where I really felt like you know um, I'm not sure whether I can cope with it and uh, I, there were thoughts of you know of, of giving up and whether or not all these whatever I'm doing is worth it um, that, that crossed my mind um, but of course, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, if, if I, I believe la, that if your intentions for doing medicine are right and your heart is in the right place, then you will pull through eventually. Um, for me personally, I thought um, there were like having healthy coping mechanisms are very important in helping to deal with um, stress and in, in uh, not, not 
failing halfway uh, in terms of having like uh, ways to release stress you know to work hard and play hard uh, whenever the time allows you to and of course you know to have friends and colleagues who are, who, who are there who will be there to support you and to help you every step along the way i think that's super important as well um, because uh, ultimately medicine um, is not something that one person alone can uh, can it's not a journey that one person alone can walk and it's uh, one of the, the few professions out there where you really need to work with different, uh, with everyone around you for, for our patients. Lah. And uh, as, as, as a house officer, I realized that, you know, the colleagues and the people around me uh, play a very important role in helping me uh, relieve, my, uh, relieve my stress and to, you know, just to make your day a bit more, uh, less tiring and less shag. Lah. Yeah, and also finally, I think um, one the most important thing that has really kept me going uh, through my house officer year is that um, it's realizing that whatever you do at the end of the day has makes an impact on your patients in some way or another. Um, be it you know just digging through their medical history for five ten more minutes, looking through the national records to see whether there's anything that uh, previously they were following up on that, that they were lo lost to follow up for, and then you know seeing whether anything needs to be done now, and or maybe after work just you know. Um, speaking to them, taking time off, you know, to, to find out more about how their life has been affected because of whatever they've, they're admitted for, um, really puts in, has really has really helped me uh, put into perspective the work I'm doing and to realize that um, everything I do and everything I say to my patients um, does make a difference to them and matters a lot to them. And I think these were the things that, you know, really kept me going. Uh. Yeah, and I think also um, just to add on, like in NUS medicine, even as a student, you get a lot of patient contact um, in your clinical and preclinical years. And through all these experiences, you know, when I was an NUS medical student, I also, uh, it also really helped me make my learning more enjoyable. La. Like, you know, rather than just reading books or, and studying textbooks all day, I, you know, through speaking to all to patients, even in, as a student, uh, helped me realize that, you know, um, the conditions I'm learning are not just scientific pieces of information, but they are also, uh, they are real life uh, things that, you know, uh, that, that affect uh, Singaporeans uh, on a daily basis. All right, thank you very much, Jin Hao. I'm glad you are rocking it. Okay, uh, uh, not that Brian is giving up, but he has something to say. Actually, um, this may seem like small when you first come into medical school, but actually I realized that in the first two years in Yonglu Lane, your grades are just simply pass-fail as compared to when you were taking A-levels or IB and you might have been a straight A student without much studying or you just get perfect sevens every single time. But then when you come into medical school, you... Uh, so, so you might feel that you're competing against people who have been getting straight A's and 7's all the time. But I think the school does a really good job in alleviating such pressure by making the first two years pass fail because it really uh, allows you to collaborate and work together to, okay, let's make notes together. Let's tackle this problem together because at the end of the day, everybody will pass together. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Brian. And I don't want to end this question you know, uh, without asking for some golden tips from someone who is very experienced, Professor Suresh. So um, I, I think uh, uh, it's normal and uh, natural to feel, uh, you know, stress. It's a tough course, um, just like any other, uh, you know, course in the university. So um, never be afraid. Um, uh, even if you fail, uh, you know, uh, many students uh, fail for the very first time in medical school and it's okay. All right, uh, because at the end of the day, it's not uh, uh, whether you fail in medical school uh, in the first few years, it's how you pick yourself up and move along. And I can tell you from experience, uh, I've seen uh, residents um, or doctors who have graduated who may not have been the best uh, students in medical school, but who blossom and who actually function as uh, the most capable, most efficient, most competent uh, doctors. So it's not all about uh, knowledge. Having said so, I think the school has a very strong and uh, rigorous uh, support system and uh, uh, we do take a lot of effort to actually support students who may have problems along the way. Uh, student Affairs does a great job uh, in supporting students who may have problems coping uh, with their studies or who may have emotional problems or um, uh, other personal issues uh, to nudge them along so that at the end of the day, um, you know, everyone graduates and uh, you know they are able to function um, as as a doctor so i think uh, it's normal and natural uh, to feel uh, this way and 
Um, at the end of the day, I always tell the students when they're feeling down, you know, to remember that they're coming into a profession, or all of you are coming into a profession for the students here. Uh, we are in a very privileged uh, position. Um, and I think last year, uh, COVID sort of reminded all of us uh, that as healthcare professionals, we are indeed privileged for many People had uh, lost their jobs. We kept ours. Uh, we continued working uh, despite the difficulties, but uh, at least we had a job uh, to go to. So I think sometimes we have to look at the bright side of things. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof Suresh. Very wise word indeed. All right. As, as um, you know, time is, is getting short, I, I'm beginning to prioritize some of the questions that are getting the most upvotes. And right now, I'm looking at this question. Um, I'm going to combine them together, more or less. What is the intake per year? Is it very competitive? And uh, is it solely based on grades? And, you know, is there an, a wait list, Professor Mary? Okay, yes. So, in terms of the total number of students that we take in every year, it's roughly about 280 to 300. Um, the number of students we take is determined by both the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education. So they more or less tell us, based on manpower projections, uh, how many doctors they estimate Singapore has to produce. And therefore, they let us know how many students we will take in. So in that sense, it is difficult and competitive because uh, we only have 280 places, uh, or plus or minus maybe 300 places each year. Now, in terms of the route to get in, uh, there would, be, of course, be what we call the standard academic route, uh, whereby you um, gain a position on the admissions interview exercise based on having uh, fulfilled a certain standard on your um, A-levels or IB scores. Uh, there is also what we call the aptitude-based admissions, whereby students who have excelled either in sports or community service or leadership or any other area uh, if they may not have made the academic part off, but they have strengths in any of these other areas, they can actually apply through the aptitude-based admissions route. And we will also look at all their portfolios and then shortlist them for interviews. So there are two ways in which uh, you can be shortlisted for the admissions exercise. I hope I've answered the question. Anything? You did. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Marin. All right. The next question. Hmm. Interesting. Why did you choose to study medicine over other healthcare causes? Well, students, no pressure, all right, because you're already in a medical school. So, in, you know, don't treat it like an interview question. Go ahead, anyone. Maybe I should dig up my personal statement from a few years ago <laughs> and find my answer. I think, uh, I think maybe this question is coming from a background of uh, maybe... Uh, myself i can explain a little bit more about my thought process i know uh, when i first applied for medicine i wasn't uh, very sure if this is what i wanted to do uh, eventually so it was just one of those things where i wanted to see if uh, it was possible or not and i think it's all right to feel that way when you first start out but what's important is to know that uh, you're doing something you need to apply with the mind, uh, with the fact in mind that this is something that you need to enjoy as well. So you may not need to have the dying passion to want to go out and save lives, but I think you must ask yourself firstly whether or not the content uh, interests you and whether or not 20, 30 years down the road you are able to see yourself uh, practicing or not. So I know a lot of my friends also, we, we all didn't uh, apply with the burning passion to want to do medicine. Uh, but now having gone through the clinical years, you end up finding your passion, you end up uh, realizing which uh, field uh, really resonates with you. And I think that's okay for, for people to experience. Yeah. yeah. I think adding on to that, um, something that I think drew me to medicine over other areas of healthcare was actually how general uh, medicine is, especially in the initial stages of your training. Um, so for our five-year undergraduate curriculum, we really, you know, the foundations are really the focus of what we're studying. So, you know, it's really about how to treat any patient in general, um, how to take care of them safely, uh, and knowing when to refer them to someone who is more specialized than you are. Uh, and I really appreciated the generalness of uh, medicine. Uh, the other thing that really stood out about uh, medicine in relation to other healthcare disciplines was the proximity that you have with patients uh, in difficult moments. I think that is um, quite key uh, to me. 
So for instance, in terms of a patient coming to terms with a cancer diagnosis, it's usually the doctor who will be the one to break that diagnosis to the patient. And knowing that this is the role that a doctor has to play over any other sort of role, which is equally important, be it supporting a patient in their recovery in terms of physiotherapy or um, helping a patient with uh, their social work, so like medical social workers. These are all very, um, these are just different areas in which you encounter a patient. For me, I just enjoyed um, the role that a doctor played in a patient's journey, and that's what drew me to medicine. Yeah. Okay. I think in also to answering this question for yourself, I think perhaps a good way to address it for yourself would actually be to go and volunteer in the medical sector. For example, personally, I volunteer at Assisi Hospice since maybe two or three years ago, and I still go there every weekend to be able to just talk with the uh, patients over there. I think uh, regarding that, I think medicine overall is, if you think, sorry, if you are still deciding whether medicine is for you, I think the large part is, have, is you have to be able to think whether you enjoy talking to people, not just patients. Because when you talk to a patient, of course, you are in a very privileged position, as Caitlin mentioned, but you're also talking to them uh, and talking to their families, their children, their loved ones and their relatives. And that is what, what, uh, one of the large parts that drew, drew me to medicine because I really enjoy talking and more importantly, listening to others. Thank you very much, Brian. We share the same passion. We like to talk. <laughs> well, I'm not as good as you in listening. Well, thank you very much, Arvin, Caitlin and Brian. You know what? If this was a medical school interview again today, we would still have offered you places. All right. So thank you so much. I know the time is catching up and I don't want to miss any, uh, you know, I don't want to miss the questions as much as I can, but uh, I'm just going to move to the last question. All right. And, there, uh, and before that, I just want to reassure everyone that, you know, there are many questions that, you know, because of time, we are unable to answer them. And, and, and don't rest assured that some of the questions which are very specific to your qualifications or such as financial aid, uh, please later on proceed to the breakout room where there are specific themes and there will be students and faculty who will address some of those uh, more intimate and, and sensitive questions that you might have. But right now, let's go to the last question, which is again, you know, very interesting. Is the jump from JC to university very drastic? How does NUS prepare you? So, I think the, uh, as Kaylin earlier mentioned, uh, the unique thing about medicine is that as a whole uh, fact, uh, as a whole batch, the things that we learn is uh, quite standardized. So, uh, the one thing that really separates the faculty of medicine from, let's say, any other faculty in NUS is that we don't uh, follow the module bidding system, we don't have uh, separate modules, and we don't learn different things even though our degree is the same. So in the end, if everyone who comes to this school uh, graduates with that MBBS, we would have all learned the same things. So because of that, the way that some lessons are structured and the way that some things are taught are very different. So for those who have uh, been through JC and A-levels, you'll be quite pleased to realize, or pleased or may not be based on your experience, you, you'll find out that actually the way that most of the lessons are being conducted in the preclinical years are done in the form of a lecture format. And so it, and, uh, it also allows for a lot of uh, self-study. But so basically, it, uh, it's sort of a reflection of the JC uh, learning process. Yeah. Yeah. I think to add on to that, uh, in terms of the jump, there is definitely a jump. Uh, things that helped me to manage the jump were, you know, talking to people, whether friends uh, in the same cohort as myself or seniors. So one thing about NUS Medicine that we have been doing for quite some time is to have a counsellor counselee system where every um, newly intake uh, freshman is paired with someone one year their senior or two years. Yeah, and there's a matching system uh, over the years. So, you know, there's someone who uh, that you can go to for whether academic questions, which is what I went to my uh, counsellor for, or for personal questions, which is also what I went to my counsellor for. And that was a very big uh, source of support for me. Uh, I think in addition to peers uh, guiding you along the way, uh, the faculty are very uh, patient, <laughs> um, you know, and, you know, there, there have been times where I approached uh, lecturers after their lectures with a question that now I realize was quite stupid, but um, they still answered it very, very patiently. So I think, you know, the support is definitely there uh, for students who might feel like they're struggling to catch up. Yeah. And, and perhaps I will also add on, you know, 
know, echoing what Caitlin just mentioned, um, we also have a program called Enrich Program, which is actually anchored by Professor Marion. And, and as part of the program, a uh, faculty like myself is also a mentor to about six to seven students uh, per batch, for example. And it's a great way for faculty like us to feel like we are in JC again, you know. So, so that helps the transition for both of us. All right. Right now, all right, uh, I think we have, you know, we finish up this part on the Q&A. You must be wondering, uh, you know, what is this book that I'm holding beneath my iPad? No, it is not the latest physiology textbook, but it is actually... The White Coat Tales, all right, as shared by our dean. And really, this uh, uh, project, this manga project, is really a love project that is brought together uh, by the entire efforts of the school, the students, the faculty, and, and, and the staff. And for those of you who joined us in this uh, session today, scan the QR code and you'll be able to get a copy of this at $9 instead of the usual price of $18.90 at all the major local bookstores. And, and this, you know, I know many of you are reading different things like, you know, when breath becomes air and so on. But this book will give you a real glimpse into what it means and what it takes to be a medical student at the Yong Lulin School of Medicine. And right now, I will hand over to Professor Marion, who will share with us a little bit on the, uh, uh, the bread and butter of the admission process. Okay, so just before we end, uh, just a few words about the administrative things. Uh, you will need to apply on the NUS Office of Admissions portal. So the application is loaded there. At the same time, you need to also submit a portfolio to the NUS Medicine portal. Okay, so whether you're choosing the standard scheme or the ABAS, you need to uh, apply through the NUS Medicine portal and put in the portfolio. Okay, now what are some of the components that you have to load for the portfolio? Uh, it will be the personal statement, a template, uh, for the CCAs that you've been involved in, your school's official testimonial, as well as, importantly, the emails of two of your referees. Okay? Uh, the referees will need to submit their referee report and the school will contact them by email to give them the link for providing the report. Now, there are a couple of key dates you need to keep in mind. So the deadline for the uh, aptitude-based admissions is actually quite soon, which is the 9th, which is tomorrow. Uh, the standard route, the deadline for application is the 19th of March, okay? And your referees would need to submit their referee reports by the 28th of March. Now, the key dates for the admissions exercise itself, uh, there are two dates for the SJT, the 4th and the 7th of April, and a whole list of dates for the FSAs, you would be given one of the dates. We would uh, really appreciate if you could uh, attend the exercise on the date you're given. But if you are for any reason unable to do so, please write in to us. Now, we expect to be able to send out our offer sometime in the first week of May. So you will be getting uh, the offer sometime in the first week of May. Now, further details as to what the exercise is all about, the focus skills assessment will be found on our school's uh, website. So they will tell you what it's all about. You will have to go through a number of stations and there'll be different things at each of the stations. So there'll be some stations where you will be speaking to what we call a standardized participant. So you will need to communicate with somebody. Uh, there are stations where you need to perform certain tasks. There might be a station, there will be a station where you complete uh, activity as a group. And then there'll be what we call the standard portfolio station, whereby you'll be interviewed uh, very much like a Q&A kind of interview style. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the Q&A session, uh, the SJT is one whereby there are a number of scenarios presented to you and you would choose this, the option whereby your response that you would do this in that uh, given scenario. Uh, there are no right or wrong answers, okay? But it's just basically giving us an idea of who you are and how you respond. This will be done online. So it's an online uh, assessment, not an in-person one. Now, a little bit about the fees. The school fees are expensive. It's probably one of the most expensive courses in NUS. Uh, having said that, no Singaporean uh, should be concerned about the financial implications simply because uh, of the cost. Uh, there are a number of bursaries that you can apply for as well as interest-free loans. Uh, the more information is available on our website as well as if you scan the QR code here, you get more information about what sort of schemes you can apply for to help defray the cost 
of medical studies. Um, this is the email address. So if there are any other questions you want to ask us or things that we may not have addressed, uh, please email the medical admissions team at the email here. Thank you very much. With that, we'll come to a close for this segment. We greatly enjoy our afternoon with you and we look forward to seeing you. And do join us in the breakout room for a more deeper and a more cozy yeah, interaction and discussion with our students and faculty. Bye-bye.